you knew her, that Sister Sherry Riley passed away in Houston this, this past week. No, we, we hate that. <clears throat> I guess everybody's probably realizing that <clears throat> uh, we got probably the president that the Lord decided to give us, which might not always be what you want, but we have to accept the Lord, what he does. <clears throat> and uh, now I'm just hoping that the that the conservative party will maintain the, house, the Senate. We'll have to see what happens there. Anyway, um, just remember this. Jesus is head of the church, but God is in control of the whole world. If it's through Christ or however he does it, he's in full control. So for the people of God, that's a wonderful thing, that God... God's hands on his people and he'll see us through no matter what. <clears throat> um, okay, I think uh, to this morning, if you would turn to Exodus, the 20th chapter. I want to talk a little bit on the Ten Commandments. Uh, one of the first things I will mention about them is is that um, the first four of the Ten Commandments has to do with your individual relationship with God. The remaining six has to do with your relationship with your brother or people. And so, <clears throat> I don't know, we may not get past just the first four today because I think it's very important. Um, anyway, we'll start in the, the uh, 20th chapter. Um, of Exodus, verse 1 says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the first one. And, um, you know, <clears throat> I think, you know, I don't know how many people, you know, a lot of people, our kids, many of us growing up, we believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because that's what we were told. Uh, at some point, you got to get established in the fact that there's only one God. He does have a son. He does most of his work through his son. But um, there's just one God and there's no other gods. Um, if you'll look in Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, we'll, we'll go back to this 20th chapter several times, but if you'll go to Isaiah... Uh, 43, verse 10. It says, let me give you time to get there. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved, I have showed. When there was no strange God among you, therefore you are my witness, saith the Lord, that I am God, 
Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? That word let there means, it means the same thing as to be said. And who, who could roll that back? Who could change that? <clears throat> um, then, then let's look in the 44th chapter, the next chapter in Isaiah. Um, verse 6 through 8. It says, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Notice that. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who, who is I shall call, and shall declare it, and shall set it in order for me, since I appoint the ancient people, and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Um, fear you not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. So, <clears throat> um, you know, to come to finally, for it to be established, at some point in your life, you're probably going to at least wonder about maybe some of these other gods. If you don't, you may not be given your, you may not really be established. You know, if you're just, if you're like the person who just keeps cutting off the edge of the ham, just believing what you've been told. But at some point, you got in your mind have to have it established as to why you really believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, of course, these other gods that you hear about, <clears throat> um, you know, for example, Mohammedism. Mohammed, he was a God-fearing man in the beginning, and but he... He got exalted. He began to feel like he was called even above Christ and that he would change the writings of the Bible into the Koran and, and, and start a whole new religion out of it. And, you know, so somewhere you have to look we, and, and listen. <clears throat> We've got children today in America. They don't know who they believe in. They don't know whether or not God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is really the true God. And I'll tell you why. It's because their parents never had it established in them strong enough that they could establish it in their children. And so, um, you know, when we do have, you know, you can't just go by data and you can't go by writings. You can't go only by history. But we do have not only the writings of the Bible and not only the historical or the witness of history and science itself, uh, archaeology, that helps us to know that, you know, Abraham, Noah, you know, we don't have a whole lot of knowledge before Noah, but we know Noah existed. Uh, that's in history. His children, we've got evidence and and knowledge in history that Shem, Ham, and Japheth existed and that they were ancestors to their uh, progeny or their lineage that came after them. Um, then Abraham, Isaac, uh, and Jacob, Jacob being the father of uh, the 12 son, his 12 sons, his name was changed by God to Israel which Jacob's name meant trickster, and his name was changed to Israel, which means to rule like God. And uh, so the nation, uh, sometimes in the Bible it's called Jacob, but uh, we know it basically as the nation being Israel. Uh, and we've got that history which bears witness, but there has to be more than that. There has to be a witness from God himself that he exists and 
we do have the history of the many times that God bore witness, how he bore witness with, in, with Abraham. He and Sarah had a miracle child after they were even unable to produce children. And then <clears throat> uh, Isaac produced Jacob. Jacob met uh, and wrestled with an angel in Luz, which was later changed to the uh, to uh, Bethel. And, uh, you know, so God bore witness all down through the Old Testament. Of course, you have to believe that to an extent, but somewhere you've got to have a witness. Uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God but you've got to have some you got to have some witness from God and that's how faith comes faith isn't something that I convince you of or some you know the or your reading or anybody convinces you of but faith is an operation of God through the spirit that God uh, he he deals with you by, by His Spirit. You will know when God has dealt with you. God will give you experiences and bear witness to you that He's real. And that, that takes God to do that. No one can do that with just convincing evidence. But, but here, what I'm dealing with here is a relationship with God. For you to know God you're going to have to uh, develop a relationship is going to have to be developed through um, through your God number one dealing with you. you, you you're not going to uh, you're not going to become a uh, a child of God or are established in God without you having develop some sort of relationship and that's developed through search you have you have to search you got to have to search in your mind for God and to know the true God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob not just hear about him not just know that he or believe that he existed you know there's a whole lot of differences like when the Bible says you know that uh, the, the all too familiar scripture for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him. That certainly does not believe that he existed. But to believe in him, you're going to have to have a relationship with him. You're going to have to, if you actually believe him, then you're going to have to believe what he, his life represented, what he taught. The witness that he had, Jesus said this, he said, I am not alone. There is another that bears witness of me. There, God, no doubt, there was great anointing and great power of God that operated in Jesus' ministry. Today, you know, you shouldn't be able to deny the fact that we have great witness from the Spirit of God visiting our services and visit your life even individually it depends on how much time you give to God how much time you spend in prayer and meditation whether or not God's going to speak to you in an individual way which he will he'll speak to you on your bed he'll he'll he can speak to you by uh, a word a dream uh, you know an angel a prophet of God minister of God and and you'll know it's God right at that moment. Now, it's easy in the flesh to maybe think, you know, that was I just dreaming? Was that, you know, did I just get worked up? You know, uh, I can remember when I was a young man, after I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I, I backslid, and it was quite a while from the time I spoke in tongues, and I wondered, do I, is this real? You know, did I really get the Holy Ghost? Is it really a true thing? You know, uh, because I'd been away from God and I lost that witness in my life. I began to doubt. But when I got hungry enough, and even in, on an individual basis, I gave you all the, you know, my testimony about how I, I, I was, uh, the, the first year I was out of high school, I was really trying to figure out what I, where I was going in life. What is life all about for me? 
what I was going to do. Of course, that was back when, you know, Vietnam was hot and heavy. And, and back in those days, everybody had to join the draft. You had to, you, you, you would get thrown in jail if you didn't join the draft. That was a requirement by government. And then when, if you were going to be drafted, it, it was posted in the paper. Your draft, your your draft number, you know. So I knew, I knew when I was going to get drafted because my number came out in the paper. So I knew I was going to get drafted. So I just went down and joined. I thought this well to get this over with. I'm going. This was well, well to do it. So, you know, I joined the army. But uh, what did I bring that up for? What was I talking about that made me bring that up? Yeah, there, there you are. Is, is I was looking for, you know, I mean, I was disturbed in my life because I didn't know, you know, I didn't know what life held for me. And, um, you know, I've told you all the story about me. You know, I, I, I lived alone uh, or away from home in, in Houston, Texas. My parents lived in San Antonio. My dad got transferred there in the Army Corps of Engineers, and he became the electrical inspector over the four a military bases there in San Antonio, and um, I stayed in Houston. Well, um, I later went back home to my mother and dad's. Just you know, I I thought about joining. Uh, I mean, uh, going to college, uh, but I couldn't. By, by the time it came time to get to college, I, you couldn't you couldn't get out of going. At first, if you was in college, you didn't have to go to Dom. At first, but then, uh, if you it, then it then if you was married and had one kid, you wouldn't get drafted. And then they dropped that. It got hot enough that you had to be married and have two kids. That's why my brother had two quick kids pretty quick. <laughs> I wasn't married at, the, at that very moment, so I had to, you know, uh, I didn't have no excuses. So it looked like I was going to go no matter what I'd done. So. I was all disturbed. Anyway, I told you about, I was at my mother and dad's. They lived out in the country in San Antonio, Texas. And I, one night I walked, out. a summer night, I walked out. I could hear the screen door closing behind me. And I walked down this old dirt road lane that went out to the highway from where they lived. And about three-fourths of the way down that lane, I began to break down and start crying. And I began to look up and call on God. I mean, just like that, I began to speak in tongues. The Spirit of God come all over me. And uh, I smoked L&M cigarettes at the time. I never will forget, I, I throwed that pack of L&Ms as far as I could throw them on my way back to the house. <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, but the Lord really made himself known to me there that night. You know, that, this. You, what I'm saying is you've got to have some experiences with God in your, in your development of your relationship with Him. That has to be established. And, and it's, not, it's an ongoing thing. You, you, you may not, you may have experiences with God, but for you to get to the place, I mean, at some point you're going to you know, begin to go back and say, well, you know, well, I do have history of Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I've got history of the 12 tribes. I've got history of the happenings. Not just the Bible bears it out. Historical facts bear it out. And so uh, all of that coupled together with the experiences God gave his children. So <clears throat> somewhere you've got to continue to develop your relationship with God that that you know there is no other God. Then we, we, we've got a capsule of God's creation. Uh, that's, an, that, that's interesting. Of God, God's creation is an interesting thing. It's not only interesting, it's, it's marvelous, it's glorious. There's nothing to compare it with that we behold as creation and that we ourselves are part of it. Uh, somewhere you'd, have, you'd be a fool not to know that it'd take a higher power to create what's been created. And so this is an ongoing 
Um, and for those of you, if you didn't get here in time, I'm, I'm talking on the Ten Commandments, and right now I'm dealing with the first four, because the first four commandments has to do with your relationship with God. The last six has to do with your relationship with mankind. So he starts off giving the first four commandments that has to do with your relationship with him and your being established in him. So verse 4, uh, it says, uh, thou, shalt not, let me, thou shalt not make any, uh, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. So that's the second. Now, notice he gives more, he adds more to it here in this than he did just even the first one. He qualifies it a little bit more, but the second commandment is, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Uh, and let's go back to the, um, the 44, Isaiah 44, I believe. Forty-four, and we'll start in the ninth verse. <clears throat> they that make a graven image are are all of them vanity. Their detective and their delectable are desirable things shall not profit, and they are their own witness. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. Who hath formed a God, or molten a graven image, that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen, they are of men. Let them all be gathered together, and let them stand up. Yea, they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. The smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals, and fashioneth it with hammers, and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry, and his strength faileth. He drinketh no water. We're talking about this God they made. And he's faint. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He maketh it out with a line. He fitteth it with planes, and marketh it out with the compass, and maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. He heweth him down cedars, and taketh the cypress and the oak, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash, and the rain doth nourish it. Then shall it be for a man to burn, for he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it, and baketh bread. He maketh a god, and worship it, and he maketh a graven image, and fall down thereto. He burneth part of thereof in the fire. <laughs> God's making fun. In other words, you know, he's showing, okay, you make, you form this God out of, you know, uh, wood. Then you cover it with brass or with silver or gold or whatever you want to make. But the same God, you know, that you made out of wood, you, you use it to burn in the fire to get yourself warm by. Or you make it, you, you use it to burn in the oven so you can cook you something to eat because you're hungry. <laughs> He's just showing this God's pretty dispensable. <laughs> uh, it, <clears throat> anyway, but you're, you're, you're here we're dealing with, and, and these things, you can't hardly separate them from one another. It all goes together having a, a graven image. It's basically an idol. And even though God initially is dealing with the principle of, of realizing there's just one God. You can, there is no other God. You can't fashion a God. He can't 
eat, he can't drink, he don't know nothing. He, you, can, you, know, you can burn him up with fire. You know, this is all a man's doing. But when it comes down to us, I mean, that's where it starts out. That's where you got to start out is there is no other God. There's, no, there's nothing I can make into an idol. When you make an idol, that's something that's delectable or desirable to your own flesh. I want my God to be what I want God to be. There's people today that, that their God, they believe in Jesus Christ, but he's a fantasy to them. It's what they want Jesus to be. My wife met a, a lady uh, maybe a year or so ago that is a breeder, and this woman, she is a case and a half. This woman cusses like a sailor, but she may cuss like a sailor to you in one breath, and the next sentence she's talking about God and how she loves Jesus. And, <laughs> I mean, she, this woman is as corrupt as they come. And Sister Smith has tried to deal with her a little bit, but I think she's, I think she's wasting her time probably. But anyway, but this woman, she's, she's drawn to Sister Smith somewhat because she's always got troubles in her life. So she calls Ann in. It's kind of like Ann, like, like David playing the harp for Saul. <laughs> you know, calm his spirit down. <laughs> it seems like she calls her and Ann plays her harp and she calms down. And so, but, uh, but then, you see, this can, this can break up into factions in your mind about idols. Let me tell you something. You can make an idol out of William Souders. You can make an idol out of your church. You can make an idol out of your pastor. You can make an idol out of doctrine, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll use one, one I've got on to people a lot about. Sister Crow don't like to hear me talk about it, but it's necessary. You can make an idol out of standards. You, could, you can believe that standards will make you righteous, which is a lie. Your standard will not make you righteous in any way. If you think keeping a commandment will make you righteous, you are sadly mistaken. Now, your faith in God and your walk of righteousness will that's what will develop your standard of righteousness that's what will cause you to dress right that's what calls you to act right and behave right but there's many people and I've dealt with this I've been in this over 40 years and I've dealt with people about this many times that people hold up a standard and that's what they equate to being righteous they don't really have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about everybody. Standards are important. Hear what I'm saying. I'm not against standards. I'm against making an idol out of them. I'm against making an idol out of William Souders or the term body of Christ. You can't make an idol out of this. God's body, you know, it is a, it is a, it's, it is an absolute fact that God has a body of people in the earth but you can't put that up there's some people puts it up above Jesus Christ they'll talk about the body and never call Jesus his name because they are worshiping an idealistic idea you got to get beyond that you got to get beyond that you got to get to a place that you realize what the where's the balance of understanding about God's body his ministry now, I'm not tearing down the ministry. I think our ministry ought to be reverend. I think they ought to be honored. I think, I think they ought to be lifted up. I think they ought to be recognized that God chose men out and that men have suffered their livelihood, gave up their livelihood to do the work of God. I think that's to be reverend. At the same time, I don't think any man ought to be worshipped. I think he ought to be respected. But I don't think we ought to put him in a place where Jesus belongs in our heart. So, so idols, this uh, not making a graven image and falling down and worship it, see, it's greater than just saying, okay, I'm just going to take a piece of wood and you know, I'm going to make Buddha out of it. We're going to uh, do whatever you do to Buddha. <laughs> you know, I don't even know what to do to it. Anyway, <clears throat> and, well, in India, they've got many gods. You know, people comes back 
they, when they die, they come back as a cow. They won't, you know, and different, uh, you know, they've got all these gods that they worship and pay homage to. Well, but this God in heaven, you know, you, you can't take away from the fact he doesn't want a graven image. I would even carry it as far as to say, you know, if you're worshiping a statue of, of, the, of Mary, if you're worshiping, a, if you're carrying around beads, if you're worshiping a little cross, see, if you'll notice in the body of Christ, we're not real heavy on that. In fact, we, you, there's almost no churches in the body of Christ that's got a steeple on it. You'd have to know the history about those steeples, where they came from. They're, they're idealistic. They're idealistic. Um, <clears throat> You know, so we're trying to, we try to keep ourselves, you know, from, uh, you know, from anything that, that puts a focus that's outside of Christ, outside of what God's purpose and plan is. God's original plan, you know, he, he, he created everything he created in seven days and he finished his work and he rested and what that means is is he finished the whole work from the beginning to the end of eternal life in those seven days it, he, he finished it you got to get in it you got to understand what his purpose was but he, he did the whole work and entered in, in and he entered into his rest which is where we should be headed um, so I hope I'm you know, making myself somewhat plain about what I'm trying to say because I think it's important uh, for us to understand what kind of relationship we need to have with God and what we really believe about God and what we know in our understanding concerning God. Um, the uh, Sure, sure. In our society, uh, my question is, would you help us um, with guidance on how to prevent from making something an idol? Our society is so brand-driven, and there's so much pride that's integrated in how we do things, how we, where we go, what we purchase, that it... It's, it just seems so easy for us to give over to something that we shouldn't and, and find ourselves neglecting the things that we should or should not neglect. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's where this working on our, our relationship with God. I recently made the statement that fellowship produces... Uh, uh, it produces uh, unit trust. It produces our trust. In other words, our relationship with God, you're going to learn to trust him the greater relationship you've got with him, and it's going to take fellowship. It's going to take you having a fellowship with God. And that's what these, these, four, these first four Ten Commandments. See, Jesus never done away with these two, these commandments. These Ten Commandments are still very much intact. This, this thing about what God did. I mean, he, the mountain went up in smoke. Uh, Moses' face was shone so bright that the children of Israel couldn't even look at him when he came back down from receiving this from God. It was emphatic uh, that that God spoke to them and gave them the, these Ten Commandments. And then there's 613 ordinances that came, that applied to those commandments. Uh, you know, in application, God, God gave them in Moses' law so that they could get an understanding of this, you know, that, that God would work on them. And, of course, they missed it. There's no question for, for most of them they missed it but it's going to take it is going to take you working on a relationship and then uh, knowing the word of God to a point where you, where you're not you know building an idol because you can make an idol out of anything I mean anything that 
begins to get more focus than the Lord gets in your life could become an idol. And, and I mean, you can make it out of anything. You make an idol out of a job. You can make an idol out of, out of uh, you know, a house. You can make it out of anything. You can, you can begin to love things, and that has to do with your fleshly desire. And that's why it's, it's difficult just to come down with one thing or two things and say, here's, you know, I would say the easiest way not to become, uh, not to allow idols to take a place in your life is for you to, 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 to make it a regular thing. Make prayer a regular thing in your life where you're spending some time with God on a regular basis and then the word of God that you're keeping the word of God in you know uh, we're living in such a fast paced society you have to make yourself do it it has to be part of your schedule to read the word of God to uh, meditate on the word of God you know it's not just reading it but to meditate on the law of God on the Word of God, day and night, you know. I mean, I, I think it ought to be enough part of our life that we think about it often. We, we, we you know, there's things that goes over in our, li- our minds. and um, You know, I know that we have basically, as far as the body's concerned, I think we've pretty well lost the, the standard of not having a TV. I mean, I think it's pretty norm. You know that, but but you have to learn how to control it because that thing can control you. I mean, you you can you can a television can absolutely control your life. I'm just going to tell you right now, there ain't a thing on there hardly fit to watch. <laughs> There's just not. And you know, I mean, you, so you have to look for things that are uplifting in life. And before long, you'll be watching things that tear life down, tear principles down. You know, making fun of. Uh, people making fun of what's right and upholding what's wrong. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what's wrong with our country is we've got leaders and uh, media. You know, I heard somebody say this the other day, and I agree with it. The media has done more damage to our political system in America than Russia and China put together. There's no question about it. The media is a is a liberal media and they just keep putting before you they always keep running down anything they don't like and what they do like they'll uphold it and people watch enough TV that that just gets put before you and so you know it's it's a job we we are like salmon we're swimming upstream <laughs> everything's coming against us you know so you your life has to be honed in to you know think about God what God did. It's amazing what God did that he put that he put uh, the children of Israel he told Abraham he's going to do it. He told them today he's going to put them in slavery for 430 years. God took just a, there was just a little 70 souls that went into Egypt that God made that possible through through uh, uh, Joseph and and here God put them there and put them through slavery to let them develop. They couldn't have developed any other way, but he let them develop into, a, into millions of people instead of 70 people. And then, then God made it hard enough on them that they'd be willing to be delivered from their slavery. You know, God, God made it rough enough on them that when he sent Moses as a deliverer, they were willing to get out of there. And, uh, and, and so God put them through that to build a righteous seed, a righteous people, that his will would be done in the earth. And, uh, you know, so uh, we're... I would say this as bad as I as I wish it wasn't true, but I would say we'll have to go through uh, some 
pretty severe pressure for God to get us to where he wants us to be. I'm, 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 I'm making some bargains with God. God's is a bargainer. You can bargain with him. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've been telling the Lord, Lord, if, if you would do this, I'll do this. And if I don't do what I'm telling you I'm going to do, then you can take that away from me that I ask you to do. Now, you better know what you're asking God when you tell him that. But it just gets that serious that at some point you need to say, God, you know, you know, to, to really to have a rela- revelation that God really in your life. I remember one brother Lineker one time, he, he was in an airplane. He's looking at his hand. The, the skin was peeling off this hand. He, he could not get that healed. He tried everything he could think of. We was, we was on our way to Haiti. And uh, he was showing me, he said, Brother Smith, look at this left hand. He said, I can't get that to heal. He said, you know why? I said, why? He said, God won't let that heal. He said, because I haven't learned how to treat God's left-hand ministry right. And God, and what I've done to the left-hand ministry has created problems with me. He said, I'm having to, learn, I'm having to figure out how to get this right. God's not going to heal that till I get this figured out right. See, that took God, that took a man's relationship with God over a period of time for him to realize this ain't just something that just happened. God is my God, and what happens to me, God, you know, I need to realize God's in my life. But a lot of people are so blind to what God's doing, they're not sensitive to realize what He is doing, you know. You know, if y'all think that I just fell off my bike and that broke my neck, I think you're dreaming. I know God's dealt with me. I know he's still dealing with me. I'll probably live with this thorn in the flesh because God had to deal with me. You know, <clears throat> God has to put pressure on me. And, I, you know, I've told God that. I said, God, I want to serve you. I want to get this right without having you having to beat it out of me. <laughs> I don't want you to have to chastise me so hard that I'll do your will. I want to get it and be willing, but I don't want to be so blind that I'm not even aware that you're even working in my life or what you're saying to me. That has to do with what I'm talking about. This God in heaven that's the only true God that does not want any graven image or idol in your life. You can make an idol out of a bicycle. You can make it out of a car. You can make it out of a job. You can make it out of a person. You can make it out of a belief. You can make it out of a doctrine. That's a true doctrine. But you can be so out of balance that you've made a God out of a doctrine. You know, so we're we're having to work on the balance. And again, I think the best way to stay in balance is to stay close to him as you can get. You know, um, I just tell young people all the time, I said, what's, what's, look at the church. Just watch it. Look who's always there. Look at the faithful. And then look at their lives. The people that are successful are the faithful. Now, every once in a while, you'll get a rich sinner. <laughs> but he'll manifest himself in time, you know. But if you want to see, you know, what, what was it the prophet said? said, don't. Don't let me get rich or poor. <laughs> don't let me get too high. Don't let me get too low. Let me find the balance of this thing. You know, I don't want to get my, my eyes on things or on wealth, but I don't want to have to be struggling in poverty so much that I can't even serve you. So I want to be faithful to you and let you work in my life. Okay, let me go on. I could talk on any one of these for a while, I think. Um, Okay. Thou shalt not take, verse 7, Exodus 20, verse 7. I ain't even going to get through the 4. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. What does it mean to take God's name in vain? Okay, I want to read something to you. 
A masculine noun, the, the, the Hebrew word saw, saw, however you say it. It's a masculine noun meaning emptiness, vanity, evil, ruin, uselessness, deception, worthless, without, result, fraud, deceit. The primary meaning of the word is deceit, lie, or falsehood. God used the word to indicate that he punished Judah in vain. The word is used by the psalmist to state that all the activities such as laboring, guarding, rising early, staying up late, toiling for food were useless without God's assistance. That's in Psalms 127, 1 and 2. In the Ten Commandments, the word is used to describe what's prohibited. The, the other place where the Ten Commandments are located in the Bible, by the way, is in Deuteronomy 5. Uh, the word is used in Proverbs to indicate that which the author desires to be kept away from him. In this case, falsehood and lies. Idols were declared worthless in the usage of the noun in Jeremiah. These idols were those that led the people of God to forget him. Um... So this, this third uh, commandment is, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. In other words, just like this girl I told you about that calls my wife so my wife can play the harp for her. Her God is useless. She takes the name of God in vain. It's it's useless to her. It has no benefit to her except where she wants it. It's deceitful. It's falsehood. It's a lie. Her God is a lie. What she thinks God is a, is a total falsehood. So you can take, you know, a person that uses the name of the Lord for their benefit. It's vanity. It's taking God's name in vain. It's using it for your benefit, you know. What was it this uh, president-elect Joe Biden, he, he said he's, he's Catholic, but he's not a practicing Catholic, <laughs> or he's not a faithful Catholic. That's taking God's name in, in, in vain. To, to declare yourself to be one of God's children, yet you only do that for your benefit when it benefits you to say that you are one of God's children. But when you're around... The devil's kids, well, you're a devil with them, you know. Uh, and so <clears throat> you can, it's just, I mean, you can, you can be a part of Christianity and you can be taking God's name in vain. It, it's far deeper than cursing, using God's name in a cursing phrase. That's probably the, the, the least emphatic way of taking God's name in vain but take but we are to practice you know I think we are to practice at at um, I think we are to practice at working on our our conversation to uphold the things of God and not not belittle the things of God Brother Smith, would you mm -hmm. would you look at Second Timothy uh, three five? <clears throat> and is that the same principle of taking the word of God, or the name of God, in vain? Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Uh, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women. That's really talking about churches. Laden with sins, led away with divers' lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah, I think it's a perfect example of taking God's name in vain. Uh, it's just having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof or... Uh, it, it's useless. In other words, it's when you use God in a deceitful way. It's, it's a falsehood about God. It, does, it doesn't have any true 
sincerity to it. Um, and so, uh, so I think that um, that we 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 are to you know consider all like I was telling you all these things go together. This there's only there's only one true God. You can't have an idol or uh, about him or. You know, and you can't take his name in vain. This is all, it all has to remain true as he is. Our walk with him has to be sincere and and of truth. Um, let me go back to Exodus now. I know we're probably needing to get off of here pretty quick, but I, I think I'm going to go ahead and mention, at least to mention a little bit here of this fourth one. Um, remember the remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now notice he goes into pretty good this he goes into quite a bit of explanation about this six days shalt thou labor, do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do not do any work thou shalt. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy maid servant, thy maid servant, uh, nor thy maid servant, manservant or maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor stranger that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth to see, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Well, <clears throat> uh, that. Uh, God entered in, as I said earlier, God entered into a rest after seven days. He, he created all that he was going to do and entered into his rest. The work was finished. On the seventh day, he rested from his labors. And there is a, and God was so emphatic about the seventh day. I mean, you, you'd get killed, stoned if you broke this law about the seventh day. Because God had a, a purpose and an understanding that there was to be something hallowed and holy about God's rest. And, about, and he made man rest. So man would get some understanding that there's something beyond you, something that prohibits you from continuing to do your own thing, that I'm going to make you rest. And there was a picture in that of... Um, if let me see, uh, look at um, let me let me let me look at it here on my phone. I love this. I've got a app on my phone that uh, Leviticus twenty three three. It says six days shall work be done. But the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. I want you to get that. The Sabbath of rest. A holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Um, now, I want you to take a look at Matthew. Thirteenth chapter, I believe it is. And hurry. Oh, Matthew eleven, Matthew eleven twenty eight and twenty nine. Jesus said, "Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest." See this Sabbath of the this this Sabbath that was to be kept holy was really pointing to the rest of God that God wanted us to enter into, which really what it boils down to is the bab receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost enters into your rest. You, you have to learn how to dwell in it, which none of us have learned how to do. When you do learn how to dwell in it, you'll have overcome the flesh. That's that overcoming the flesh and maturing fully in, into life uh, 
into the, the Spirit of God, the new man, the new creation. That's, that's what the Sabbath depicts. And so entering into this rest, uh, verse 28 says, um, verse 29 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. So if you go now, if you would go to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. And I, I'm, I'm not going to give you all I got on this because I'm, I'm running out of time, but I'd like to give you at least for you to know that keeping the Sabbath holy has to do with your relationship with God of learning how to enter into his rest. Uh, the fourth chapter of Hebrews um, We'll just start right there in the first verse. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, nor being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. They, although the works were finished from the foundations of the world, for he spake in a certain place on the seventh day on, that, on the, this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all of his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, for, the Jesus, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoke of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God for he that is entered into his rest he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his now go to Revelations 14 right quick and this will be the last verse Thirteenth verse, Revelation fourteen thirteen. He said, "And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth." That's not talking about graveyard death. It's talking about dying out to sin. Because there wouldn't be no benefit in dying, just dying naturally, when the bride's being made up in this chapter. <laughs> Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. This is exactly what he was saying. That the Sabbath has to do with our relationship with God that causes us to enter into his rest and to cease from our labors as he ceased from his labors. And we no longer are doing our will, but we've entered into God's perfect plan for eternity so I think these four if you just meditate if y'all just take what I just what little bit I gave you here today and just meditate on these four things it lets your mind expand a little bit it'll help you in developing even a greater walk with God a greater relationship more fellowship with him it'll cause you to trust him more it'll cause you to be in unity with him more when he said, when he pre prayed and asked God to make his disciples one, even as they were one. And that promise goes out to us. He didn't pray for them, but also for them that heard them. So, anyway, give you a full hour today. <laughs> Thanks for listening to me. We'll take a break, go upstairs. God bless. <laughs>